We are here. Welcome. Welcome to the live audience. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the precipice of America's second civil war. Uh, I am your host, downtown Josh Brown, here with my co-host, Michael Batnick. As always, Michael, wave hello to the people. My bad. I'm like, where's that? I had YouTube out in the background. I apologize. I was about to freak out. That's my bad. Hello, people. Don't interrupt. Don't interrupt. This week, we'll witness a rapid succession of bank failures and rescues around the world. The Federal Reserve will hike into a full-scale financial system meltdown and the broad daylight arrest of a former U.S. president on felony charges. So not that much going on right now, but we are very, very fortunate to be joined tonight by Jesse Isinger. And Jesse, we wrote like a fancy introduction for you. Can I, can I do the intro? Uh, the fancier the better. Yeah, absolutely. It's, well, it's, it's super fancy. You are, uh, you're somebody I've been reading, I don't know, probably since... Probably since I started my blog. I mean, you're... you're uh, since the last banking crisis. Since the last... <laughs> All right. Jesse Isinger is an American journalist and author, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting in 2011. He currently works as a senior editor and reporter for ProPublica. He is also the author of the book, The Chicken Shit Club, Why the Justice Department Fails to Prosecute Executives. Jesse, we are... So thrilled to have you on the show tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's going to be great. And I've been reading you uh, since the last financial crisis, although I've been writing since uh, many, many financial crises ago. So I know. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting old now. I am aware. Is this the most fun one so far? Uh, well, you know, in 2008, I really thought we were um, I, I got, you know, cash out. Um, of the that's my children in the background. I apologize. No worries. Um, I'm going to send them uh, signs to uh, keep quiet in a second. But um, yeah, I, I I got thousands and thousands of dollars out of the of my bank account. And I thought that we were really um, that the banking system was going to stop working. So that was not fun. But this is uh, this is um, less serious. I would say. I think so far it's less serious, and let's hope it yeah. stay. I mean, it's serious if you are. I suppose, an employee of one of the affected institutions. And I definitely don't want to make light <laughs> of what that must be like to wake up and, and have that uncertainty. Uh, you probably have been compensated by stock options over the years. You're probably not an employee who's in a position to be doing interest rate hedging. And you're just sitting there. You know, Credit Suisse probably uh, will have more than 9,000 people let go, according to the last thing I read. So that's, that's obviously not fun for anyone involved. However, oh wait, before 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 we get to this one, the please. big differences between this time and the last time, and there are a number of them, is that right now it's it's limited to regional banks for now, uh, which is a good thing. I mean, it's obviously not good, but it's good that it's not J.P. Morgan that we're questioning. Number one, yeah. number two, what was in question or what drove the asset liability mismatch was Treasuries, right? It's not toxic shit that you have no idea what yeah. exactly is going on. That'll be the next shoe to drop. So let's just start with. The big news of the day. And Jesse, I want to get your reaction to this. Um, UBS's official announcement slash victory lap over the weekend on the merger, the shotgun uh, merger that the Swiss government cooked up. Um, Basically a forced merger for Credit Suisse. And it looks like a giveaway to me, uh, to UBS. Um, This is the chairman, Colm Kelleher. Quote, this acquisition is attractive to UBS shareholders, but let us be clear. As far as Credit Suisse is concerned, this is an emergency rescue. We have structured a transaction which will preserve the value left in the business, limit our downside exposure, acquiring Credit Suisse's capabilities in wealth asset management, Swiss Universal Banking will augment UBS's strategy uh, of growing its capital like businesses. The transaction will bring benefits to clients and create long-term sustainable value for our investors. Not bad as far as, uh, as, far as corporate comms go. Um, what was your reaction when you first heard about the terms of the deal and how quickly it had to come together? Yeah, I would say, of course, he's going to say that now. Um, and Credit Suisse has been a basket case since the financial crisis. Um, yeah. And the, it's kind of the slowest moving bank failure uh, we've seen in our um, recent years. And so uh, I would say that there are probably a bunch of big problems there. What they would like to do is 
get paid for all the assets under management, um, get, you know, let go the dupl duplicative uh, operations. And then they very nicely had the Swiss government, and the Swiss taxpayer uh, uh, take care of all the real problems there. So I think it's probably going to work out for UBS in the, you know, the, the medium and long term, but there are going to be many more headaches for UBS than they're anticipating now um, because Credit Suisse has just stumbled from one problem to the other in recent years. One of I think the, that's we, probably one. That's probably one of the reasons. That's probably one of the reasons why the price, the sticker price, seemed so low. You know, people are comparing three billion dollars to like you know a small cap company. Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that, and it's not really three billion dollars. We really don't know what the liabilities are. Today, Matt Levine said the upshot of this for UBS is not that it paid. 3 billion franc to buy its historic competitor. The upshot of this is that it has assumed hundreds of billions of francs of liabilities and taken on a bunch of assets that are probably worth more than that, but it's hard to tell over a weekend or ever really. Yeah. Right. And I think that the big problem looming in all of this is, uh, and it's really kind of starting to affect bank stocks here is that they're sitting on, portfolios that have disastrous loans. Um, and we just don't know how disastrous they are. But in a rising interest rate environment where um, people have been lending like maniacs for the last 12 years, um, we're going to have big, big problems. And we just don't know how big those problems are going to be. And, that, you know, people are realizing, you know, the last few days, something that Obviously, people have known but uh, haven't cared about for a while, which is commercial real estate. Um, you know, and uh, commercial real estate is going to be a huge problem for lots and lots of banks, particularly regional banks. You'd imagine um, that the cities outside of the main big cities are uh, are not going to recover very well, and that's going to really hit regional banks. So, um, you know, Credit Suisse is the same similar kind of problem where they're going to be sitting on lots of uh, unknown liabilities in a rising interest rate, slow growth environment, and that's going to be a problem. I think uh, I think one of the one of the interesting takeaways from looking at how this was structured is how much bad will they're getting like in terms of what the, what their capacity is to be able to do write offs uh it's a huge line of credit with the Swiss National Bank i think 100 billion dollars or so uh if they need to tap it not to mention uh a 9 billion dollar government backstop um so they they kind of like sat there and said okay we're the only acceptable buyer. Here are our conditions. This is very different from 2008 and the stuff that you were reporting on then, where the government was trying to put all kinds of conditions on the buyers. And as a result, you had, you had like JP Morgan, for example, have to not just assume liabilities, but assume court cases on behalf of Bear Stearns. And that does not appear to be what this uh, negotiation looks like. Do, I, do you think I have that right? Uh, bad will is that your coinage? That uh, that's, that's nah. I, I, I read it today one. too. I read it today I've seen too. It all, it was, I've seen it yeah. all over the place. It's that's uh, a good I one. think it's it's a way to think about the negative stuff that comes along with this. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. how much of, of that will. you can write down without a without a penalty. I love uh, I love that. I hadn't heard that one before. Um, well, I don't know if I agree with your characterization of uh, 2008 it, particularly. Um, there were shotgun marriages and. Jamie Dimon uh, feels very um, feels very resentful about um, not being hailed as a hero for having taken over Bear Stearns and Wamu. But um, in Bear, the Fed um, took care of uh, tens of billions of bad loans. I, th I feel like it was thirty. Uh, that's the uh, the number that I recall. Wamu had a very nice franchise, um, and uh, J.P. Morgan is emerged the solid winner and um uh and yes there were some uh there were some legal liabilities there but um but they essentially came through scot-free and then jamie dime was able to stay in his position um he's become a billionaire uh he has been the steward of this you know essentially public trust 
um, of J.P. Morgan that he didn't found. He's not an entrepreneur. He's not a founder. Um, you sit there and uh, you didn't lose your job and you become a billionaire. I don't think he has much to complain about. Same with Lloyd Blankfein, you know, um, uh, somebody like that became, I think, a billionaire. Um, it's, uh, again, public steward, a steward of a franchise that um, was totally backstopped by the government, saved by uh, the government. Um, so I don't think that there was r- really onerous conditions placed on most of those guys. I, I so used it was to just think more that, complaining than it was the reality. Yeah, I think that they wanted to be hailed as heroes of the republic. Um, and then when anybody complained about them, they uh, they were extremely petulant. I mean, if you remember, uh, there was a kind of embrace of Wall Street of Obama in um, in the election. And then Obama once said that they were fat cats and um, he lost Wall Street because their feelings were hurt. I mean, I was mostly peak um, uh, you yeah. know, and he criticized their bonuses. You know, they he criticized um, Wall Street getting paid bonuses in 2008 for when everybody blew up the entire world. Right. I used to think that Jamie Dimon was overpaid until I saw what happened at SUB, and I'm, now I'm not so sure anymore. <laughs> so w- other weird, weird things that happened over the weekend is that, first of all, there's no shareholder approval. The government basically forced this thing through. So there will be lawsuits, Josh. You mentioned liabilities court. There, there will be lawsuits. The other thing is there's this funky dynamic that they have over in Europe uh, that has been in the news. These AT1s, the additional uh, tiered capital, the, the, con- the contingent convertibles. And so there was, a, there was a quote in the Financial Times today from this guy, David Serra, who is a founder and CEO of a company that apparently held a lot of these. He said, quote, they've changed the law and they have basically stolen $16 billion worth of bonds. Uh, this has been a big policy mistake, and they will regret it. Switzerland will be the new pariah in this loss-absorbing bond market. They asked for it. They will have it. So in other words, they, I think there was $17 billion worth of these bonds outstanding that went to zero. And the equity holders, while they didn't get very much, they got a little bit. And so it's this weird dynamic where the bondholders were wiped out, the stockholders got a little bit, and there was no shareholder approval. So it's just a very odd thing that happened. Yeah, the, the theory is that not the theory, the reality is that what those bonds were at risk for is pretty explicit in the terms. You just never think it's going to happen, and it rarely does happen. Um, The second part of that is I think the equity holders had to get something maybe to prevent this from being some sort of another phase and an uprising and court battles. It's like, all right, it's not zero. You're getting three billion or whatever. Pick a number. It's an immaterial number to UBS, given the five hundred billion in uh, in assets and, and liabilities and the much bigger numbers they have to deal with. Uh, maybe the Saudis had to get something to shut up. Um, I'm just I'm just like my my working theory would be the number couldn't actually be zero, even though it's as close to zero as possible. Uh, I don't know, Jesse. How do well, you think that went down? Well. Uh, I would say that, you know, these kind of crocodile tears from these guys um, is uh, all too predictable. We saw very similar dynamic with the GM bondholders, if you recall, and um, and the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie. Um, when those were taken over, we saw we saw lawsuits and a lot of complaining um, and people saying that the government acted unlawfully. And I I don't know I can't predict um, Swiss litigation at all um, or the way that would play out. But in the U.S., what happened was uh, you know the uh, government essentially said we had an emergency and we invoked emergency powers and these investors can go pound sand. And two things happened. One, the investors lost those lawsuits. And two, they all came back. You know, they all, you know, it wasn't like, um, you know, j- they have all come back to Argentina. You know, they came back to the United States. They came yeah. back to the bond market. They bought the GSEs. They've come back. Um, uh, they went back to Argentina. And so, you know, I give them six months, eight months, 12 months uh, at uh, the outset to come back to uh, both the Swiss market and uh, these convertibles that uh, they knew were going <laughs> to be. Yeah, they're not going to become they're not going to become failure. Marxists as a result of as a result of this. I, I you know, um, they're what they're going to do is become anti-government libertarians until they need the next bailout. That's what they're going to become, just <laughs> like our friends in uh, Silicon Valley. The combined entity here is going to have 
$5 trillion in assets or six times the annual GDP of Switzerland, does this get to a point where UBS is more powerful than the Swiss government? Um, cer certainly it'll be, it'll be larger um, if you, if you want to measure by, by just the sheer size of the goings-on uh, under the umbrella of the bank. But is there some sort of risk for Swiss society to have an entity this large with no actual native competitor? I think that's a very astute point, and it goes to your first point that uh, who was actually um, in who had the leverage here in the negotiations. And Adam Tooze, the economist out of uh, Columbia, made this point today as well that uh, you know who really bailed out who and who was um, in charge of this, and uh, you know it sort of at, superficially looks like the government um, was the handmaiden, and but really. UBS was driving this, it seems. Um, and that's why we think, you know, that's why I would think that uh, over time, it's going to be very profitable for UBS and very good. But it leaves this really disconcerting aspect uh, to that UBS is a more powerful entity than the Swiss government and dwarfs the Swiss government. And, um, Opti and optically, doesn't at least, it'll the, look that way. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely the right uh, the right thing to understand about this and uh going forward i i i think it means only bad things for swiss society um you know a, a country we should say with a great history of of independence but you need states now it seems to rival the power of these great uh financial conglomerates and corporate international corporate conglomerates and the u.s does and the eu does but whether the Swiss government can really rein in its corporate giants, I'm, I'm skeptical. Can we jump back across the pond, back to our shores, and talk about what happened over the past weeks with our banks? There was an article in the Washington Post, Post oh, excuse me, talking about um, what the politicians were discussing, and somebody said uh, anonymously, quote, they were becoming increasingly concerned about a bloodbath on Monday, and I think everybody agreed. I made the point that if they didn't panic on Sunday, they probably would have panicked by Monday. Charlie Munger was talking to Jason Zweig in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend. He had a great quote that said, uh, the way the world is, the government had no alternative but to back all the deposits, or we would have had the biggest goddamn bunch of bank runs you ever saw. Yeah, well, I... I sort of feel like I, I'm very confused about what happened on Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And um, I think what was happening was that investors were performing fear and um, and the the distinction between performing fear and panic and actually being fearful and panicking are uh, maybe became it became irrelevant for policymakers like um, on Sunday you couldn't tell whether it really was that regional bank um, investors were going to sell off because of SVB's collapse um, and you took action and by taking action you kind of validated the fear and the panic um, which uh, strikes me as bad policy um, but Bad policy that's born of uh, the downside. Maybe it was a my, mild downside. Maybe a 10% or 15% um, uh, kind of scenario that there really was going to be a genuine panic, as Munger was saying. But you know, what we we have is the facts, which is that SVB is a relatively small operation. Um, it uh, was concentrated in one area of the economy, an important area, but not remotely um, that significant for the economy. The, the estimates I saw was that, you, that if 30% of the companies that, uh, you know, that SVB had about 40,000 clients, um, companies, uh, and that you know, all told that that meant if 30% of those couldn't make payroll, we're talking about 120,000 jobs. And that's a big number and important for those people, of course, but that's not systemic for um, the country at large. It systemic, the I, think, I think what made it systemic was the reaction in the other regional banks. And one of the things that I, I think one of my lessons from 2008 is that there doesn't have to be fire when the market is in this mode smoke is is good enough 
and ultimately smoke can become fire the longer that things remain unaddressed. And I'm not like a, a bailout queen where I think, you know, just fix it, just fix it, just fix it. We'll worry about the moral hazard, la hazard later. Uh, that's not my mindset. But these aren't investment banks. They're not hedge funds. They're not private equity funds. They're literally uh, institutions that are housing regular people's uh, bank accounts. And so I think – and it's these are small – many of these banks that are seeing their share prices get cut in half uh, – I wouldn't say are completely blameless because I haven't looked at all their balance sheets. I'm not an expert, but it seems like whatever they were doing, it's not the reason why they're getting caught up in this. It just seems like they're in the wrong segment of the industry. And there could absolutely have been uh, follow on bank runs. That's, I think there was like no good option here, Jesse, I think is what I'm trying to say. Um, do you see it that way? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like we need to really understand what the government was seeing, but I basically the government saw um, a possibility of regional bank runs. That's obviously what they were convinced could happen on Sunday. Um, what you're saying is that traders, um, stock market traders were, you know, going to shoot every regional bank on Monday. They, um, well, they they were they were they, in the process of it, yeah. And so, and, and depositor, doing, depositors would have done the same. So would would that's that's the question that we can't really um, we'll never really be able to answer or resolve. But would small businesses in Georgia be pulling their money out of their regional bank? You know, and if they watch this, the news, yes, I think so. I think so. Th yeah, like it. That's I think that you I think we have a kind of we we certainly have a national media and we have um, uh, an incentive to panic um, and incentive. To, and we have, you know, markets panic. Markets are prone to panic. But um, but m my view is that if you had a if you had had a regional, I mean, sort of a focus specific um, type of rescue for Silicon Valley Bank that was um, regionally focused and private sector driven that you wouldn't necessarily have had to do the, the bailout that we saw. Now let's, and the, the bailout came in two forms, right? So it, the FDIC uh, expansion of insurance and then the Fed window opened up for regional banks. And I'm not actually against um, Fed 100% guarantee in principle. That's been an an, op, uh, an argument on the left for a long time, and I'm kind of sympathetic to it. But um, this was done at a uh, you know when policymakers had a gun to their heads, and they had a gun to their heads by some of the wealthiest people in America, you know, who happen to be libertarians, many of them. But that's sort of um, just hypocrisy. That's not particularly important. But mm. what I thought was that there could be a private sector solution to save Silicon Valley, that venture capitalists could make payroll. Um, at the companies that they um, had backed uh, that um, to in order in, you know, enlightened self-interest to preserve the equity value of those companies um, and shore up the payroll until Silicon Valley Bank was worked out by the FDIC. That would have been my uh, a preferred solution. And I think that would have assuaged the panic. Jesse, but if this, you're, if you're this right. had started, I wanted to ask you if this whole thing had to, to your point, if this whole thing had started at a regional bank in the state of Maine or um, oh, totally. somewhere, in, totally. somewhere in industrial Ohio, and the deposit base was not a Twitter uh, – like they didn't have this social media uh, savvy, some would say addicted deposit base. It probably would have bought that bank more time to find a private market solution. Um, but the fact that this is – happens to be a bank – that banks, Twitter psychopaths, um, I think, accelerated the, the the timeline of this whole thing. What do you What That's do you think? Totally, about that? totally right. If this was the, as I've been saying, um, if this is the first bank of, well, I guess I won't say bum. Um, if it was the first bank of Podunk, um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you're allowed to swear. Oh, uh, you could do anything. We don't really care. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, the uh, 
we wouldn't be having this discussion. The bank would have gone under. The FDIC would be in there. Um, the uh, depositors would uh, be waiting for their money, and they would get 90 to uh, 100 cents on the dollar the way most banks work out. It just would have taken a little bit of time. This is this happened because two things. One is that they're on Twitter, um, and Twitter can be mistaken for real life by the the kind of chattering classes, which include journalists and venture capitalists. And the other thing is they could get they could get Janet Yellen and Janet Yellen's aides on the phone that weekend instantly. And so and so they they got those people on the phone and they told them that there was a panic and they had to do something. Um, I was very unimpressed and, by her response. It was a it was a congressman from, I think, Oklahoma who asked her very pointed questions about, so let me get this straight, does this mean that a bank failing in my state of Oklahoma, automatically the depositors are not at risk and will be made whole by the government? And she acted like it was the strangest question in the world. And she acted like she didn't have any idea that that would be asked of her. I was blown away by that. This woman has been in government for, what, 50 years? For I don't even know, 40 years? She she stumbled over the most obvious question that could have come out. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't see that exchange. Um, and lucky. she's extremely smart, um, yeah. and thoughtful, thoughtful and capable um, person. So obviously she's thought about this and thought through the implications. And, the you know, even when you're doing something in an emergency like this, you've thought through the implications of what it means to expand um FDIC insurance uh, for these depositors. And what that's going to mean is we're going to have a policy in the next um, X number of years, uh, sooner rather than later, that guarantees 100 percent um, for depositors. No choice now, um, right? Yeah, I, I, we're on. You, I, I don't see how you don't do that. And so if that doesn't it's that if that's not accompanied by a whole series of reforms and oversight, um, regulatory reforms, Fed accounts, things like that, then um, we're going to have given a huge gift to the banking sector um, for very little. I'm so glad you brought that up because this is the second order effect. So now you say to the banks, okay, we're actually going to fully backstop all depositors, secured and unsecured, no such distinction anymore. But here is the new cost of FDIC insurance for all of the banks in the system. And here are the new restrictions we're putting on what kind of deposits you can take, how much oversight we're doing of the risk that you're taking in your, uh, in your asset management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The end result of all of that, the second order effect is probably less lending to less people uh, and maybe more lending to the people that don't actually need to borrow. But so a further expansion of income inequality and a less effective banking system for the every the every man or the every woman. Um, that's like me just like gaming this out over the next three years. What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, that's probably true unless you have a series of public options that make um, loans available to uh, people with lower incomes um, from the government, which of course will be deeply resisted um, uh, by Republicans. Direct and, lending and, from the Treasury or the Fed. Yeah, yeah no one's going to want that. You know, Fed accounts, direct lending from the Fed, direct, um, uh, you know, with the post office doing some of this kind of stuff. Um, there have been proposals on the left uh, floating around for a while. Um, the Biden administration is, um, you know, the most progressive uh, presidency of my lifetime. And um, the economic advisors are um well aware of these things of course they you know in these possibilities and these proposals uh, of course they're not they don't have the house um right now and so uh and the republicans are not going to be constructive about this remotely even though they'll try to score political points because this is kind of um you know was done in the heart of nancy pelosi land and they like to score points against california but you know so so it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out because we are probably not going to get those reforms, but we have an expectation of a guarantee now. And that's, that's probably the worst world to be in. In the aftermath of all this, people were looking to point fingers, understandably so, at who's to blame. And there is a lot of blame to go around. You wrote a post uh, 
a couple of days ago, regulatory failure 101, what the collapse of Silicon Bank Valley Silicon Valley Bank reveals. And I thought it was interesting that you didn't necessarily take the Fed to task in terms of them leaving interest rates at zero forever and then jacking them up to 450 basis points in 12 months, but rather uh, on the regulation on the regulatory side. So you said bank regulators have awesome powers. They can go into a bank, examine its operations and demand changes. The problem is they rarely do. Why, why is this always the case? How can we all, the, the, it never seems to happen beforehand. It's always wh- where were the regulators every time? Yeah. Um, well, we have a really poor regulatory culture. Um, and what I was, uh, this, the essential argument there uh, in the piece is that it's not just about tools um, and laws. Um, it's about regulatory culture. And the regula- regulators have to understand that we have an extremely fragile banking system. And they have to understand that uh, bankers are extraordinarily reckless and greedy. And you saw SVB's management um, be extremely reckless and greedy. Um, for a few you know, pennies per share, they didn't hedge their exposure. They didn't change their uh, interest rate exposure. And you know, Fed monetary policy is Fed monetary policy. And I think that's a separate issue that you could debate. And um, I think that the Fed has been raising too aggressively. Um, but uh, they've signaled it very clearly. No, no one uh, a year ago or six months ago could have mistaken what Fed policy was. Um, but SVB didn't want to hear it, um, they were extraordinarily reckless. Now, now, the Fed supervisors should have seen this coming. Yeah. I was I wanted to ask you, do you think in the inevitable hearings that will follow this episode that it's likely to come out that – it's likely to come out that there were people keeping abnormally large unsecured balances at Silicon Valley Bank – because of other things the bank was giving to executives of, of these companies, not necessarily in the best interest of the companies themselves. Do you think that there will be uh, conflicts, whether explicit or implicit? And do you think this is an area where um, you're going to see some, some liability on the part of the depositors and or, and or the companies that they had money on deposit for? Yeah, that's a great question. I think if um, uh, if I were in charge of a team of investigative reporters at the Wall Street Journal, this is the main question that I would focus on right now. Um, and I think that it's highly likely. My instinct is that there were all sorts of concierge banking services that were being offered and sweetheart deals. You've seen you've seen a few glimmers of this, hints of this coming out already. Um, and there was a lot of tying. Um, tying of uh, different kinds of um, business together and tying of loans and deposits. That's a kind of that's basically almost what banking is. That's banking. So, yeah, um, I was going to say. So that's uh, that that's legal and that's kind of um, endemic to to it. it. Doesn't have to be, but it's basically they're intertwined. But there are all sorts of things that wouldn't necessarily be. Um, intertwined or typical that um, SVB may have been doing sweetheart mortgages, uh, personal kind of um, uh, personal loans of all kinds. You can you can imagine um, a lot of stuff. I think that's going to be a very big deal um, in the investigations. I come. wonder I wonder if that's why it's taken so long to find a buyer. Is they're like, wait a second, what sort of loans are on the books that we have to like? comb through to figure out what shit might hit the fan six months from now, 12 months from now. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and maybe the, the franchise wasn't big enough and important enough to take over. So you just feel like I can swoop in and get these, um, these startups. Um, why do I need to take on this kind of liability? And, you know, to your point earlier about how the heart of the 2008 financial crisis was what we didn't know on balance sheets. That's basically why the, we had a financial crisis. Um, uh, here, there's a, like a small balance sheet of, of a lot of shit that we don't know about um, in term. And, you know, one of them is legal liabilities. And Jamie Dimon went around the country saying that he wasn't hailed as a hero, that he had to um, uh, take all this opprobrium um, and, uh, 
and you know be shamed about being a banker. And so you know he's saying, don't do what I did there. Don't take over SVB. Um, and so they're gonna the government's gonna have to midwife that in some way. Um, that's gonna be I would suspect a little bit ugly. And you know it's gonna be annoying to us to as taxpayers to look at what they do. Uh, John, we have some charts. Put up this Nick Timoreus tweet. This is showing uh, the net increase in emergency lending from the Fed last week. And obviously, San Francisco is the big standout. I think the New York thing is related to Signature Bank and uh, First Republic, which are pretty large presences in our market. Of the net $297 billion increase in reserve bank assets, $233 billion come from the San Francisco district. 55 is from New York. Does the rest of the country look at the chart off, please, John? Does the rest of the country look at the shit and say the coastal elites are at it again? And why? Like, does this become another focal point in the culture wars? That's what I'm saying. Um, well, I mean, there's a lot to say about that. One is that um, to my point earlier about whether this was a genuinely systemic crisis, it's concentrated in those two areas where. Um, the news spread and you would, um, you know, talk to your buddy who was a CFO at another company. They say, well, I'm pulling out, you know, you pulled out, you, you got fucked in Silicon Valley Bank. Well, I'm pulling out of my small bank right. and putting it with B of A. Um, and so you see those channels there. Um, and yes, of course, everything is fodder for the um, for the culture wars now and the partisan warship, uh, 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 you know, or uh, partisan sort of warfare. What I what I was totally puzzled by in the wake of 2008 was why there wasn't a political coalition that emerged of um, progressives like uh, anti big bank progressives like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and um, Republicans um, from the South and the Midwest who had no big banks and no investment banks. Um, and in fact, had regional banks and small banks um, as constituents and why they didn't line up for real banking reform, um, structural banking reform. Um, and I kept waiting and waiting for that. I think the um, answer is Barack Obama in the White House. You mean he cut off that uh, he cut the Republicans off? From I think that, that was a bigger coalition? issue than than that was a bigger issue for the right than anything uh -huh. worth cooperating with the left over. Right. They, they said just, it. They said our mission him, is so. to make him a one-term president. They didn't. Yeah. There was no appetite to do anything other than disrupt the possibility of him doing anything, and, yeah. and that was the agenda. Right. Um, I, 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 I want to move right. along just so I make sure we cover um, the the other stuff that you've been working on, uh, Jesse, because I think it's fascinating. Um, let's let's skip ahead, John, to uh, let's skip ahead to the ProPublica piece about insider trading. That's not. Fully insider trading. Do we have that link? Are we, put, are we putting that on screen? Yeah. Uh, Where did it go? Oh, here we go. I don't know. No, not no, this. Did you take that out? I, yeah, I took it out. Okay. Let's let's cover that for a moment. This is the latest sure. piece that your your team and at ProPublica uh, put out, I think, over the last week or so. Basically, you guys have a trove of IRS documents, and for the first time ever, you can see what the 1% are – trading in and out of, and you guys have uncovered a situation where some executives at large companies are trading the stock of their competitor companies rather yeah. than their own. And it almost looks as though it's a legal form of insider trading. They obviously know a lot about what's going on in their industry. And by not trading their own stock, I guess they're insulating themselves from the traditional uh, definition of what insider trading is. Do I have that explanation right? Yeah, you get you got the story exactly. So this was uh, done by two of my reporters, Robert Federici and Ella Samani, and we were looking at this tax data. And you tell the IRS what stocks you've traded and what they you've sold in the given year. And the IRS doesn't look at this for securities law violations. They only care about taxes and they don't share it with the SEC. So the SEC has never seen this data. So we did something, you know, unprecedented is a overused word, but this is literally unprecedented. No one's ever seen this data. And what we found is dozens and dozens of executives who do this kind of trading. They're trading in competitors, in partners, in customers, and they're doing it with very good timing. Um, 
And we found lots and lots of guys who were like, you know, uh, a company was, they were bidding on a contract for something, somebody else won it, and the CEO uh, bought the stock of the guy who won the contract, <laughs> um, the mortgage contract, right before they won. And the stock went up and uh, he sold and made a lot of money. Here, so- here's a tweet from Ellis Amani. <laughs> this is fucking incredible. There was a pharma CEO who dumped about $1 million worth of its shares of his rival stocks the day before the company's largest one-day share pro- uh, drop in share price. How is that not illegal? Right. Well, so it's a gray area. Um, it's uh, One thing is that the SEC basically doesn't look at this or police this. This is called shadow trading. Um, and let me be clear that it's not always insider trading, you know, illegal insider trading. And we did not argue that any of these instances were illegal insider trading. We were saying that this is basically worth starting to investigate um, in many cases because well, it's where's the line? What do you, not what do you, looked at. What do you mean so exactly? The line, is, so the line is, one, you need to have material non-public information. Um, mm-hmm. And then two, you have to have a duty not to disclose it. So To your you own are, shareholders, see, though. But to your own – the mostly, duty is to your mostly it's shareholders. To, it's mostly to your own shellers, although you can have a duty to uh, not disclose uh, aspects of litigation. Um, you can have uh, you can have duty to, duties to other um, other stakeholders in certain scenarios, but mostly it's to your own shareholders. Um, and then sometimes companies have policies against this, um, even when if it wasn't necessarily. But uh, so the, it's not always illegal um and it's complicated and of course all these things are fact intensive but that guy that you were refer- that ellis was tweeting about you know he was our lead example and he traded uh when you know they it was uh he avoided a massive loss and then um he picked the stock up and wrote it all <laughs> the way up and then traded tra- <laughs> yeah bought it back and then traded it again how Perfectly hard would it be traded. how hard would it be for a pharmaceutical company to have an executive sign a piece of paper that says, I will not speculate in the stocks of, of our competitors, Direct competitors. In, in the oncology field. Like it, it seems like you wouldn't want them doing that, even if it were totally legal. It seems like antithetical to what the mission of the company is. Well, some of these companies have policies that say exactly that. Um, right. Some don't. Um, and this is just yet another example of the overweening greed of our executive class. Um, you know, they're paid to deliver for shareholders and then they just want a little bit extra. Um, and they want to take the information that really is the company's information and just make a little bit more money. I mean, one of the examples was uh, not uh, a guy who's got a lot of shareholders in a privately held company. Not clear how what percentage he owns of it. Um, but the guy, uh, Isaac Larian, who makes uh, uh, the comp- toy maker, makes Bratz dolls. And he's traded in Mattel hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars. He's traded, he's traded you just hundreds make toys? and hundreds of times. <laughs> he shorts the company. He goes long the company. He's obsessed. Um, yeah. and, uh, um, and it's incredible. And he trades it very well. So the stock in the period that we looked at had fallen something like 57%. And he'd made 11% on the stock. <laughs> Jesse, last question. Does for me. he when have a put, newsletter we could sign up for? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> when, when you put pieces like this out of ProPublica, do you hear from people in the government? You must. Well, they're very. We send them to the government. We we. Oh, <laughs> I heard from some people in the government who just said thank you. They saw it. Um, the SEC saw this story. Uh, whether they're going to do anything about it is a different th- question. Jesse, but, let's uh, talk. Let's let's finish by talking about your book, um, which a very provocative title. And I remember when it came out a couple of years ago. And let's tell everybody why you wrote The Chicken Shit Club. And I've, I've heard you on several podcasts talking about um, your frustration with how, much, how many shenanigans are out there in plain sight and why very little ends up getting done about it. What is the yeah. takeaway? So rather than go through the whole thing, I think most people conceptually understand, what is the takeaway for our audience of investors, traders, professionals who work in asset management, financial services, what do you think um, we should know about what you discovered? Yeah, they should know it's a great time to be a white collar criminal, maybe the best time ever. Um, what, you know, I work the elite impunity beat. I, that's what that's what I cover, um, which is uh, 
powerful people taking advantages, uh, taking advantage of systems and of laws um, and doing it with impunity. Uh, and I think it's a moral crisis in the country because I think that um, uh, people have realized that they need to get theirs. There's a lot of bubble thinking um, and there's a lot of thinking that there is no accountability. Um, and this, they can get away with it. I think things are mildly changing a little bit uh, with the Biden administration. I think they've actually internalized some of the uh, lessons from the chicken shit club. We seem fact, to have. Uh, two, I know a lot of people. We seem to have two extremes. We seem to have two extremes in the country about this issue. Um, on on the far left, it seems they almost look at anyone in business as automatically suspect, and maybe they don't look at it that way. But that's how their rhetoric makes it sound. And then on the far right, specifically in Trump country, there seems to be this overarching um, pessimism where they just say, well, everyone's doing it. Look at the Clintons. They do it, too. And he got away with it. So that makes him smart. And then I think like probably the middle two thirds of the country doesn't feel very strongly in one direction or the other. Do, do you think that that's like a, a, a mischaracterization? Is it is it is it too far uh, that I'm going, or what, what would your thoughts be on that? What feels very no, pervasive I, to me? I mean, I, I think that that's right. I would just say that the, um, uh, the, the left that you're describing doesn't have much political power, um, in this country. I don't think that's the Biden administration's, um, no. view, for instance, I would say the Biden administration's view is to the left of the Obama and Clinton administration. Um, but they fundamentally believe in sort of free markets, but they think that there needs to be uh, stronger regulation um, of corporations um, and stronger accountability. Uh, whether they can execute that is a different thing. But I think that's sort of the fundamental belief. And I think it's a little bit more it's I would say even say it was significantly more aggressive than the Obama administration um, on that. But um, on the right and even on the left and. I would say in the middle, there's deep cynicism about corporations. I think that cynicism is the right my, word. Yeah, I think my pet theory is that um, people are very angry at companies, corporations. They actually have these infuriating daily interactions with companies where um, they're on hold with customer service for an hour, or they, you know, they get um, they can't return a defective product. Um, these kind of humiliating, infuriating interactions, but they don't really have an outlet for expressing it. And so they it's they get angry at their government um, for it. Um, and so a lot of this is um, focused on government, which doesn't actually have much federal government, doesn't have much daily presence in most people's lives, um, but um, is the object of huge amount of anger. And I think that sort of Trump world um writ large, you know, um, where the economy has not gone right for many people in that um, they are, to some extent, a forgotten class um, and they're deeply resentful about it. And they're angry at the gov federal government. And they're angry at minorities. That's basically uh, my diagnosis. Well, listen, we want to say thank you so much for appearing live with us tonight. John, let's put uh, Jesse's book up on screen so people know what it looks like. Go to Amazon and check this out. It's probably the most uh, well-written uh, and well-researched take on this particular topic. Thank you so much to Jesse. And we can find your work on ProPublica. How frequently are, are you guys putting out stuff? Well, I know these I'm are very big pieces. Uh, yeah, I'm an editor, um, so uh, I'm not writing as much as I used to, but uh, we'll have a series of stories about the um, shadow insider trading um, all throughout the year. So I hope people... Uh, Check it out and definitely buy the book. You don't have to read it, um, but definitely buy it. Yeah. We will. We, we will absolutely uh, link to that and we'll make sure to follow up when the new stuff hits uh, ProPublica. Jesse, thank you so much for joining awesome. us and thank educating you, us. We appreciate, appreciate it. it. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.